Good morning, church, and welcome to everyone who is watching online. Good to have you with us this morning. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. This is going to be a pretty simple message this morning, but it's a message that I hope will be encouraging to you. Last week we looked at the first half of 1 Samuel 10, and this morning we're going to examine the latter half of the chapter. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, I think most everyone is, there is an election day tomorrow in Canada here. Tomorrow the people of Canada uh, will be deciding who uh, the leadership of our country will be going forward. Uh, I don't know what the result is going to be. I don't think anyone knows what the result is going to be. I have a guess myself and uh, I'm waiting, uh, I'm going to find out uh, tomorrow night if my guess is correct or not. But at the end of the day, I don't know, you don't know, and only God knows who the leadership of our country will be going forward. We're going to find that out. In the latter half of chapter 10 here, the Israelites, they're going to find out who their king will be going forward. We're going to read from verse 17 on through to verse 27. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities, and you have said, No appoint a king over us. So now present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought the tribe of Benjamin clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he is hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out, and as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There, was no, there is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. Last week, we saw that Saul had been anointed by Samuel to be the ruler of Israel. And at this point in the narrative, Israel, they have only requested a king. They don't know who that king is going to be. It's going to be a surprise for them. There are only, as best as I'm able to tell, there are only three individuals at this point who, un, who know who the king is going to be. One would, of course, be Saul himself. Samuel knows, and God knows. No one else knows. Saul's servant, who traveled with Saul on the journey when Saul was anointed, he doesn't even know. Saul's own family. Uh, there is no indication from the text that even they know. But everyone, they're about to find out who the new leader is. And this is why Samuel summoned all the people together at Mizpah, which is what we read in verse 1. Uh, they don't have an election here. This is not a democracy. Uh, they don't cast any ballots. They don't vote. They simply show up so that they could learn, so that they could find out who, uh, as verse 24 says, the man the Lord has chosen. They're going to find out who is that man that the Lord has chosen. And in verse 20, you know, we read about the process through which the Israelites come to, uh, come to learn who their new king is. Verse 20 reads, When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. 
we catch a glimpse here of the kind of process that was used uh, to reveal uh, who the Lord had selected to be king. It's referred to as casting lots. That's what they're doing here. Probably uh, the same selection process that was used in the book of Joshua to discover who it was who had sinned. And of course the casting of lots revealed that Achan had sinned that, and his sin resulted in the Israelites being defeated on the field of battle. Probably the same uh, process that was used uh, to discover who it was um, in the book of Jonah, who it was, was who was responsible for this storm coming up and uh, nearly sinking the, sh the ship. And the lots were cast and it was determined that Jonah, he was responsible. We see it also, uh, the casting of lots in the New Testament. We see it in Acts chapter 1, where the disciples, uh, they want to know who it is who should be replacing Judas Iscariot as the twelfth uh, apostle. And they cast lots, and it is determined by that process that Matthias, he would replace Judas Iscariot. Uh, we don't know what exactly the process of casting lots looked like. We know it was a selection process. I'd probably be, probably be something similar to uh, drawing straws, uh, rolling dice, flipping a coin, something to that effect anyways. It doesn't really matter though what the process, uh, what exactly it was like. What matters is that God is behind the process. That's the point here of the passage. God is, He's determining the outcome. It was understood in these days that you could cast lots and the Lord would determine the outcome. Proverbs 16.33 The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. And as we see in our passage here in 1 Samuel 10, Saul, he is the outcome of the lot being cast. Interestingly enough, uh, they discover that Saul, he is the king, but they can't find him anywhere. Uh, he's nowhere to be found. Very interesting. He is hiding. He's hiding in the luggage. Why exactly he's doing that, the text doesn't explain. Obviously, the text isn't very concerned about that. Some would suggest that the man, he has insecurity issues, which is, of course, the case when you see, uh, when you see what he is like further on down the road. Um, didn't like large crowds of people. Who knows? We don't know the answer. The point, though, is that the lot fell to Saul. The whole point uh, is that the people recognize, the whole point of the passage here, the whole point of the people gathering together at Mizpah, as Samuel has called them there, the whole point of this whole exercise is that the people recognize that Saul was chosen by God to be king. Two points for you here this morning. Two points. Point number one, God's vote. God's vote. I don't want to spend a ton of time on this here because we've already looked at it uh, a bit in previous weeks. We saw how through a series of regular everyday events, Saul and Samuel end up having this meeting together. That's not a coincidence. This is th Their meeting has been brought about by the Lord because Samuel, he's to anoint Saul as king. The reason for that is because the Lord has chosen this man, the Lord has chosen Saul to be king. The reason Samuel called all the Israelites together at Mizpah, that's to make it known that the Lord has chosen Saul. He is God's choice. And that's what verse 24 says very clearly. Verse 24, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? The casting of lots, that just demonstrated that Saul was God's chosen one. Remember, it's generally understood, it's generally understood here in these times that God is behind the process of casting lots. He determines the outcome. As I mentioned, there's no election. There is none. Not like we would have today in our home country of Canada or across the border in the U.S. There was only one vote cast in the election of Saul to kingship. And that was God's vote. 
You see this all through Scripture. As I understand Scripture, nothing has changed in this regard. At the end of the day, God decides who will rule and who will not rule. We see this throughout Scripture. We see it in the case of Saul. We see it just a little bit further down the road in the case of David. It was God who chose David to be Saul's replacement. And it was God who sovereignly preserved David's kingship. I think of the book of Daniel. I think of King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he was a man who had a pride problem, and there came a point in time where the Lord said, your rule is going to come an end for a period of time. Daniel 4, uh, 29 to 32. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, by my mighty power, for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Uh, the one who has authority over kings, the one who has authority over all rulers, the king of kings, he removed Nebuchadnezzar uh, from being king. Nebuchadnezzar's son, Balthazar, would be another example. Uh, chapter 5, verse 23 in Daniel says that he had set himself against the Lord of heaven. Bad move on his part. Bad move. That was why that fateful day came. You will recall it from the book of Daniel, where they are banqueting and the uh, hand appears and writes on the wall. And when that writing is interpreted, uh, it is interpreted to mean that uh, his reign would come to a swift and immediate end, which it most certainly did. I take from all of that that God not only controls who governs, but he controls how long they will govern. And when he has decided that their time in office is up, their time in office, it's up. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, the first half of the verse reads, He changes times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. This is written and recorded approximately 2,500 years ago. In the case of Saul, Saul was his kingship took place approximately 3,000 years ago. And what, what is true of these men uh, is still true today. What is true of God is still true today, just as God chose Saul uh, to be king. Personally selected him to be king over is Israel. He chooses, God chooses people today uh, to be president, to be prime minister, to be king, to be queen, etc. The theologian R.C. Sproul, he writes, God is the super monarch of the cosmos. He not only governs the realm of nature by his natural laws, he also governs the whole world of human affairs. He steers the whole course of the stars and the flight of the birds as they migrate. He governs the course of human history. He causes kingdoms and empires to rise and makes kingdoms and empires fall. No king is ever elevated to the throne apart from the providence of God. And of course, this applies not only to, to kings, but to presidents, uh, to governors, to prime ministers, to premiers, all of them it applies to. God always has the final say in regard to their election to office, in regard to the term in which they serve, the duration of it. How long will they serve? That is point number one, God's vote. Point number two, man's reaction. Man's reaction. We're going to consider how it is that people react. There's always a mixed reaction when a new leader comes to power. Some people are happy, and some people are not 
so happy. That's the case in our world today when a new leader comes to power, and that was the case 3,000 years ago when Saul came to power. Verse 24 reads, Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king. Many people, they were excited about the selection of Saul to be king. And they were vocal about their excitement. They shout, Long live the king. I don't know who is going to win the election tomorrow, but this I do know, there will be some people, probably many people, uh, who will be very excited. They're going to be happy that their guy, their candidate, uh, has won. Not everyone, however, is always excited. Not everyone was excited about Saul's selection to the kingship. Verse 27, But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and brought him no gifts. But Saul kept silent. There were some who were obviously really not happy about Saul becoming king. There's very strong language there. It says they despised him. They were not happy. They made their happiness known by the fact that they made their unhappiness known by the fact that they didn't bring him any gifts. Not happy at all about their new, newly elected leader. I think we all know what it's like uh, not to be happy with our newly elect, newly elected leader. At some point or another, uh, we have all gone to sleep on election night not so happy. We've all gone to sleep on, on election night, shaking our heads at our fellow countrymen, wondering why in the world they did not vote the way we had voted. We live in, a very, polari in very polarizing times, uh, where people are often, uh, politically polarizing times, where people are often not happy with the leadership, the government leadership that is over them. I think back to 2016 uh, when Donald Trump was elected as president and I think back to uh, the reaction from many people. Many people, they were uh, just, it wouldn't be enough to say that they were not happy. They were, uh, they were horrified, scared. Uh, you look back to how the media responded. Many of them in the media, they were not happy at all. They, well, I think it's fair to say they despised him. They despised their newly elected leader, just as the people in Saul's day despised their newly elected leader. A new poll came out this past week, Quinnipiac poll, it was, showed Biden's approval rating. Lowest point it's been, actually, uh, since he came to office back in January. Many people not happy with their newly elected leader. For various reasons, of course, uh, the withdrawal from Af Afghanistan has played into that a little bit, the resurgence of COVID throughout the United States. But the point is, is a lot of people not happy. Uh, just like in Saul's day here, a lot of people not happy with their newly elected leader. It's not just down the States, we see it here in Canada too. Uh, we don't see, uh, in regards to Prime Minister Trudeau, we don't see it maybe so much in the East or so much in Ontario, Quebec, but you see it a lot in uh, Western Canada. A lot of people not happy with the Prime minister. I was listening to Steve Farrar this past week. He's a pastor from down south. He was leading, I believe it was an evening service at Chuck Swindoll's church in California there. And he was talking about how he heard that song on the radio, and you might know it, the country song. Uh, God is great, beer is good, people are crazy. Well, he was talking about how he would like to rewrite the song, actually, and he had a new title that, uh, for the song. It wasn't going to be God is Great, Beer is Good, and People are Crazy. He was going to call the song, God is Great, the Bible is True, and Our Leaders are Insane. That's the way a lot of people feel nowadays. That's the way a lot of Christians feel right now. And I think to a large extent, with good reason, 
Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Uh, there's a great deal of moral confusion in our society right now. We see it in many places. We see it in the media. Uh, we see it in uh, the institutions of higher learning, uh, academic institutions, universities, colleges, etc. Uh, but we also see it in governments. There's a great deal of confusion, uh, moral confusion amongst our own leaders, individuals who can't tell right from wrong. It's, uh, it's getting worse, actually, which really makes for a bad leader. A leader's job, government leader's job, according to Scripture, according to the Apostle Paul, is to restrain evil and to promote good. Well, if you are unable to tell good from evil, how are you able to restrain one and promote the other? It doesn't really work at all. And when we have leadership over us that... Uh, we view as bad and sometimes is bad, it, um, it becomes easy uh, to despise them, just as the people in Saul's day, some of the guys, they despise Saul. Uh, it becomes very easy to do that. But here's what we need to remember. Here's what we as Christians need to remember, especially when it's election night in Canada and it doesn't go the way we want it to go, especially when we don't like the governing authorities over us. Uh, we are in a time where a lot of people feel that uh, it doesn't matter who would be elected. Not happy with any of them out there. I was listening to the radio a couple weeks back and they were just, it was a talk show and people were calling in and uh, uh, giving their opinion about the parties here in Canada. And some, some people were simply saying, it doesn't matter who, I'm not happy with any of them right now. Here's what we as Christians need to remember. This is the words of Charles Spurgeon. He who feels that everything cometh to pass according to God's will hath a great mainstay to his soul. He need not be shaken to and fro by every wind that bloweth, for he is fast bound so that he need not move. This is an anchor cast into the sea. While the other ships are drifting far away, he can ride calmly through. A Christian's life is not supposed to be a roller coaster of emotions over the events of life. We're not supposed to be freaking out every single time something doesn't go, something out in the world, something bad happens, something doesn't go the way we think it should go. Uh, every time the economy takes a turn for the worst, every time a government leader is elected who we think... Uh, isn't qualified to be elected every time a government leader makes a decision that we think is foolish. And a lot of times government leaders do make decisions that we, uh, that we do think are foolish. And I, a lot of the times they simply make foolish decisions. When you lose the fear of the Lord, uh, your decision-making process goes very much down the drain. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We have to remember the words of Proverbs, Proverbs 21 and verse 1. I have put this on the screen for you in the New American Standard Bible Version. The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Every time we look into the world of politics and we re hear on the news, uh, watch on TV, and we see that a political leader has made a decision we don't like, and it seems like everything is spinning out of control, uh, we need to remember that everything is under control. Everything is under control. Sometimes we need to remember... We need to remember that, especially when it's election time, things don't shake out how we're hoping they will. No need to fret. No need to lose sleep. No need to get upset, like some of the Israelites did. I look back, uh, I, I just look at the text here and I go to myself, I go, why do they despise Saul. Why do they despise him? They have just seen that God has sovereignly selected this man to lead them. Why do they despise him? 
you'd think that they would sit back and go, okay, the Lord has chosen this man to be king. He has sovereignly brought him to this position of leadership over us. Um, maybe God knows what he's doing. Maybe uh, we shouldn't be upset over this. We don't know why God has picked this person uh, to be representing us. I mean, uh, you know, if it were me, I would have picked someone else maybe. But, you know, God has picked this person here. So maybe, uh, maybe we shouldn't be quite so upset. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be fretting quite as much as we are. Maybe God's got a plan here. This is maybe what they ought to have been thinking. And this is maybe what we should be thinking more often too. God has in an election, He has the final vote. He has the final say. If He doesn't want a political leader getting into, uh, being re-elected or coming into power for the first time, they're not going to be. He has the final say. It's His call at the end of the day. He is sovereign over whoever comes to power, over the whole process, over the casting of ballots. He's sovereign over it all. I leave you with the words of R.C. Sproul. God is not a registered voter in human affairs, yet He is the one who casts the deciding ballot in every human election. It is only by and through His providence that anyone ever wins or loses an election. The dissenters in Saul's day would have done well to remember that fact, and I believe today, 3,000 years later, we would do well to remember that too. And I hope that you will tomorrow, and we'll see how it goes. Vote and pray. Let's pray now. Lord, we thank you for this word. We thank you for, Lord, speaking to our hearts. And, Lord, uh, this is a, um, it is a tense time, the time of election. And there's a lot of concern. There's a lot of worry. There's even some fear. I pray, Lord, that we would be Christians who would remember the truth that we see here in this passage that we've looked at this morning, that you're sovereign, that you're in control. We see it in Scripture that you're in control of the wind and the waves, and that you're in control of all kinds of things. You're also in control of who gets into office. That's true 3,000 years ago. It's true today. Help us to remember that. And we don't, Lord, we don't know why sometimes you put people into positions of power the way you do. Uh, we don't understand the purpose behind it, but God, just help us to trust in the fact that you're in control of all things. And we don't need to know. We don't need to know. We need only to trust. Help us to do that. Today, tomorrow, as we go to the polls, Lord. And every day afterward, help us to trust. We pray this in your name. Amen.